Ah, wine. The muse of poets, the inspiration of philosophers. Or, as I think of it, a fruit-based alcoholic beverage. It isn't. Just tell the viewers what we're up to. <sighs> we're in California on a mission to turn wine buffoon James May into a new world wine connoisseur. By sampling the nicest. That is the best glass of wine I've ever had. And nastiest. That is unspeakably disgusting. Californian wines on offer. Four days ago, I set out with wine god Oz Clark in a camper van. So far, we've been to Santa Barbara, where I discovered that, unlike the over-intellectual French with their silly appellations and communist tendencies, here you can grow what you want, where you want, and tell it like it is on the label. And now we're going to find out just how liberated the Californian winemakers are as we head north to meet the hedonists of Paso Robles. On Oz and James's big wine holiday... Adventure. The New World. For the second stage of our journey, we're heading to Paso Robles, the brashest, most up-and-coming wine region in California. The winemakers here are bending all the old world rules. They're taking France's Rhone Valley grapes, Syrah, Grenache, Roussanne, or even taking Rhone Valley and Bordeaux grape varieties and blending them together. Now that is a uniquely new world idea. My quest, as ever, will be to find a drinkable California wine that we can buy at home for under a tenner. <sighs> Let's talk about that later. Who hasn't put the crockery away properly? Ah, uh, you got a right racket. If you want proof this place is the hot ticket, even the French are moving here. We're en route to meet Stefan Asseo, a winemaker of 17 years' experience in Bordeaux, who's decided to bring some French savoir-faire to the Paso Robles Résistance. He is a Frenchman who got tired of being French, yep. essentially. And, and he came, came over here. here to be Californian. To become Californian. And how successful he is, we'll soon find out. Already I smell a rat. The idea of coming to California was to get away from the baffling French and their talk of terroir. On our first wine adventure in France last year, terroir was James's biggest bugbear. It's a French word with no actual English equivalent, so it doesn't appear, presumably, in the little pocket gem French-English dictionary. But it probably should. I could write the entry for them. It will say French terroir, English cobblers. This French term is used to cover all the effects that Mother Nature has on the taste of a wine, but the whole concept was simply too much for James. OK, James, remember, it's French. Be polite, right? Yes, yes. Hey, hello. A decade ago, Stefan had had enough of making Bordeaux, stifled by rules and regulations, and moved to Paso Robles to be part of the Rhone Revolution. Hold on a minute. Oz Clark, a Frenchman, a vineyard. I've not already made this programme. And the only way to have a chance to make good wine is to have a nice vineyard and also a nice soil, what we call in France a nice terroir. Which is the combination I knew it. It's all a plot. Oz Clark has dragged me to the other side of the world to meet another of his posh French mates. But here's the incredible thing. After a decade in California, Stefan has lost virtually all of his Frenchness. I escaped from that to be free and to have a huge field of experimentation, no regulation. Honestly, all my focus is to make the wine a wine from Paso Robles. Hmm. So what exactly is a blended Californian wine made by a Frenchman like? So now we test red. Optimus. You've mixed Syrah, the Rhone grape, with Cabernet and Petit Verdot, the two really dark Bordeaux grapes. You would have been sent to prison if you'd done that kind in of. your vineyards in Bordeaux. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Have a have a small mouthful as if I needed to encourage you. Right, I'm going to take this opportunity to embarrass Oz. When you fry onions and a, little, a few little bits are left behind in the pan and go completely black and then afterwards when you finish eating you look at them and you think, oh that looks interesting, and you get it out with a fork and put it in your mouth, that's what it is. Sort of caramelised, toffee-like flavour. Yeah. It's not as big and chocolatey as the other red wines we've had. It is, I hate, I hate having to say this, but it is more French, isn't it? And it's more <laughs> clever. Oh, that's really. the way I, I am the you, father. Huh? You can take the Frenchman out of France, but you can't take France out of the Frenchman. <laughs> this is a 40 pound bottle of wine, yeah. at least, really, if and you never got it, to it England. It would be 50 or 60 in England. Right, yeah. so once again, you've, you've upheld the spirit of my quest here by bringing me to a place that produces a hideously expensive and inaccessible wine, nice though it is. We're still drinking very expensive wines. 
we haven't got a wine that represents America, a wine that is industrialized, very good value for money, and yet maybe not brilliant, but very drinkable. That's what I'm looking for. That's why I came here. The reason Stefan came here is because New World winemakers have the freedom to make any kind of wine they choose. And there's an event up the road where James has got the chance to sample them all. The Paso Robles Cook-Off is an annual cookery competition between local wine producers. This is a fantastic chance for us to actually go and taste the wines from the West the wooded canyons in the west, taste the wines from the prairies in the east, really get a feeling as to what Paso Robles is all about. It looks like a piss up in a field to me. Is that what it is, essentially? Well, it could be. What it really is, is showing that when you get into these small wine communities in places like California, everyone actually mucks in together. This event even attracts the godfather of Paso Robles, students, Gary Eberly, someone James has to get to know. We call this Dos Aviators. Randy and I are both pilots. So am I. Oh, okay. He flies a Commander, I've got a 340. That's quite and posh. I've got a Luska mate. While Chuck and Biggles impress each other with their knowledge of light aircraft, I'm going to do what I set out to. I want to taste all of these fast right, and furious. Meanwhile, I sense that there's plenty of wine in the weeks ahead, so I stock up on American classics. Beer, burgers and frozen margaritas. That's very nice as well. Yeah. This is tasty. Tasty. No, I am doing immensely. After an hour or so of enthusiastic tasting, I've completely lost track of James. Well, there's, there's nice blonde girls around offering him beer with lime in it, so he's happy. People are offering him hamburgers, so he's whopping them down his throat. I think he's having a lovely time. I've nothing to do with wine. In actual fact, I am sipping wine with Big Gary Eberly. Impressed with my aeronautical knowledge, he invites us back to his estate to have a go on his boat. Gary Eberly is a real pioneer. Back in the 1970s, he took the gamble of planting grape varieties from the Rhone Valley in France, and it paid off. I brought Syrah to California. I mean, I planted the first Syrah vines post-prohibition. For years, I was the only source of Syrah in the United States. There was, there was nothing in Paso Robles. Uh, I don't want to say I created it, but uh, I created it. Your humility yeah. delights this guy. And I'm really cute, too. After carefully sampling all of Big Gary's vintage Syrahs, I'm ready to make the first of my well-researched observations regarding New World wine versus the French stuff. So far, I think, overall, the Californian wines are more enjoyable more often and then more consistent. There was a lot of stuff I drank in France that was what should be illegal, to be honest. They should go to the guillotine for making that stuff. Whereas here, I haven't had anything bad. I've had a few things that I'm not particularly mad about, but I haven't had anything that's made me think, good God, how can these bloody peasants drink that stuff and still have colons? The next morning, I'm feeling a little fragile. Even the wine god is struggling. Typical. All I wanted was some porridge. I mean, just a porridge, a great big box of porridge oats. But oh no, in America you have to actually have everything in a sachet. I don't like being told exactly how much porridge I can have. I want to make it myself. One morning I might want more, one might, I might want less. Ow. That's hot water in the kettle. Is that what you want? Yeah. <laughs> I've decided it's time for a break from wine. I'm on a personal pilgrimage, and as I'm driving, Oz is coming whether he likes it or not. We're going to investigate another Californian product, Hollywood superstars who die young. On September the 30th, 1955, James Dean died on this road when his Porsche Speedster hit a slow-moving station wagon. And that is a motoring fact. Did you know that James Dean only bought that Porsche because he was bored of waiting for a Lotus that he'd ordered. God, Porsche as a stopgap. 
well, purchased my dream car. He was a film star. Well, you had one until your wife sold it for you. <laughs> Bang and stop and stop. Bang and stop. This memorial was erected by a wealthy fan. And for some reason, it reads like the back label of a bad bottle of wine. An individual struggling, struggling in this, in this huge, huge land of, of infinite, infinite promise, promise and many races. races. Now that would That's be the Shiraz. Uh, we're on a break from Wine Oz. This is a motoring moment. This I know what this is. This is a translation from the Japanese, isn't it? It's like, it reads like the instruction leaflets of an early uh, Kawasaki. <laughs> well, this is, this is a Japanese memorial and the Japanese yeah, exactly. put it up. Yeah, see it. He was a rebel without a cause, James. He was a rebel without an airbag, unfortunately. Well, let's go and have a memorial hot dog. 